I want to tell you about a serious problem I used to have, a bad one. And it was a problem that eventually could have killed me that I tried for years to change by myself and I couldn't. And it's the fact that I used to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day for like 16 years. And this has everything to do with my childhood trauma. If you were abused or neglected as a kid, you very likely have had similar problems. Addictions, depression, an inability to see a good future for yourself that's worth not having an addiction for, or maybe you've lacked follow through on things you've tried to improve about your life, because that's how it was for me. All of those were wrapped into my smoking problem. And even though I was healing in a lot of areas of my life at the time, I was so stuck on this thing. Smoking was one of a couple of problems. I didn't seem to have the ability to change at all. Now there's a cold hard fact around these stuck problems. Childhood PTSD with all the usual symptoms of that, no matter how much you want to change, you might hit a wall and people try to help you and that doesn't work. And you do all the things you're supposed to do and nothing happens. You don't even know sometimes like what you're expecting to happen, like what would, what would healed be? And you just want to stop feeling so bad all the time. So smoking was like that for me. And then one day I broke through and I want to tell you how I did it. And I want to explain this very carefully because with most of the people who've ever asked me how I did it, I lied. I didn't feel safe to tell them how I really did do it. I was afraid to speak the true answer, which is through prayer. All right. I'm reluctant to be honest about it because I know a lot of you watching will immediately pull back and judge me. I'm pretty sure anyway. Whenever I mention God, there are always some snarky people and unsubscribes in the comments who ridicule that. And I'm used to it because that's exactly what my traumatized household was like growing up. My family did this to me when I was a kid. I did it to other people who are religious or spiritual or who talk about prayer. I put them down for years, like acting superior to them really confidently, even though like my life, I just had so many problems. So it's kind of ironic, right? I was sure that I was right, that there was nothing out there, but I wasn't always like that. And things got bad enough when I was in that view that I tried something I thought that I would never try. And the thing is, I got better. I got better in a few major ways over time. And the day I quit smoking was one of them. And that is definitely not what I expected at all. Now, believe it or not, I have not touched a cigarette for more than 24 years. And frankly, that is just impossible. That's not something I could have ever done. Smoking was so woven into every part of me. It was like years. It was like this and, and, and so many years I was trying to control it and couldn't. And then one day it went away and the way it happened followed a certain pattern that I've now repeated in my life on some other very tough symptoms and behaviors connected with my trauma. So at some point I'll talk about some of those other like massive healings I've had, but I want to tell you exactly what happened with the smoking. So first of all, nothing that other people ever suggested to me for quitting smoking worked. All right. I think there are a handful of people who will just get lucky and spontaneously quit or they meet some incredible person who changes their inner lives. I always wish that would happen. And then, and then your personality gets softer and you get happy and then you just forget to smoke or forget to eat. I never relate to those stories because for most of us, quitting an addiction is only going to happen if we pretty much throw ourselves into an honest fact finding about everything we're doing that's making life harder. You know, not just the addiction itself, but like the bigger picture and then being more brave than we've ever been before about facing it and doing something about it. So yeah, the fact that I stopped is for me a miracle and without a shadow of a doubt, I know that I could not have done that unless some kind of spiritual power had come in to assist me. So I was a heavy smoker 16 years before I quit. Two packs a day is 40 cigarettes. Sometimes it was like 50 cigarettes. Maybe sometimes it was 37 cigarettes. I didn't count very often, but that was every day. 
and I wanted to quit. I'd made at least, I don't know, 25 or 30 serious attempts to quit. I'd get a few days or a few weeks clean from cigarettes and then I'd relapse and get full on addicted immediately, which was so depressing. And you know, I always thought, oh, I can have one cigarette. I, you know, it'll just be this one time. It's just the usual story with real addictions. Like it just never worked out that way. And I was so ashamed of myself. I kidded myself that people didn't know how bad the problem was. I was always trying to control how much I did in front of other people or try to make them think I was a non-smoker, which is sort of funny now. I was constantly trying to wash the smell off my hands, cover, like I'd put on like, I called it a smoking jacket. It was just this ratty old bathrobe and I'd go outside and wear it. I put a towel over my hair so the smell wouldn't get in my hair and then I'd take a shower. I mean, I was going to a lot of trouble to try to smoke and look like I didn't smoke. You know, and that's not crazy. There's, there's a lot of situations where smoking is really stigmatized. People think it's low class and I used to have a lot of fear that, you know, I always looked low class and was never going to like get a promotion or get anywhere in life or a boyfriend <laughs> if I smoked. So one thing that was really motivating for me to quit was knowing that, they, that like a good partner probably would have that standard for themselves. I wanted to get married and have kids. Having a good partner, all of that was like resting pretty heavily on this hope that I could stop. I started to smoke because I heard that I would lose weight. And when I started to smoke, I was about 18 and I did lose weight at first. Don't get your hopes up. At first I lost weight. And I knew also that my mother smoked heavily while she was pregnant with me, like heavily. They did that back then. And I wondered if this explained why the first time I ever like smoked a cigarette, even though it like the first time you do it, it really feels poisonous and gross. But that little buzz of nicotine I got, felt so comforting. It was like the feeling I had always been looking for. And I used to stand outside, which was, you know, usually required when I smoked. I'd stand outside, take a drag off my cigarette and think to myself, oh God, I love smoking. <laughs> and cigarettes were, they were my way of taking a break, collecting myself, getting my thoughts together, just getting a little distance from stuff that stressed me out. And they functioned, I'm pretty sure, as a very crude antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication for a while. You know what they did? They re-regulated me. I had no idea what dysregulation was, but I was dysregulated. And so long as I smoked, I had a way to kind of like pull it back together. I used cigarettes to push down anger and sadness. And I'll tell you back then, I was angry and I was sad. And cigarettes gave me just a little... Um, kind of numbness or distance from people. It's a numbness that felt like energy. I don't want to make it sound too good because it's just a fake thing that completely made me sick. But when you have childhood PTSD, oh, you, you need a way to get distance. Having a way to get distance from, from stressful situations is like inner strength. It's not inner, well, smoking is not inner strength, but the distance is necessary sometimes to cope. And so, you know, I teach these techniques where you can get that distance all the same without having to do anything addictive, if you choose. If I would try not to smoke, it wasn't just that I craved cigarettes, it was the feeling of just inner wretchedness that would just bring me down. It was so harsh that the only sane thing to do when I felt that way to save myself was to be to smoke again. Like what difference does it make if I was gonna be that depressed that I might felt like I might not even survive what did it matter if, if I got lung cancer? I, you know, I just have those thoughts about it. So I go, screw it, I'm just gonna have cigarettes. I smoked when I was sick. I smoked when I visited my mom while she was dying of lung cancer from smoking. I smoked while I was spraying bleach cleaner on a moldy wall and inhaled particles of it. And that I remember very well, I could feel was really bad for me. It's like I was smoking in cigarettes that had like bleach particles on them and it was like, <gasps> And for years, I've always had a little fear, like what happened when, when I did that. I put myself in danger from smoking. I would stand outside bars at night by myself just to get a cigarette. Smoking is almost certainly a big factor in how I developed a reactive airway. And for a long time, it's getting better now, but for a long time, every time I got a cold, I would then have like two months of like chronic coughing, sort of like asthma. Smoking also, probably played a role in bringing on Graves' disease. That's a thyroid thing. 
it's, it is triggered by smoking and stress. And both of those things were going on big time in my life when I suddenly got very sick with it. And it, it's a serious thing. And I had to use radiation therapy to heal from it. And in fact, when I, when I received the radioactive iodine as treatment, they said, whatever you do, don't smoke. So I was a physical wreck at that point, getting radiation treatment to actually kill my thyroid tissue. My muscles were wasted. I was deeply stressed out. I was spiritually worn down and I was feeling totally alone in the world. And honestly, at that time, even though I knew that it could later cause cancer by drawing radio, radiation particles into my lungs, I couldn't, I just could not not smoke. I couldn't do it. So about that time, I visited my stepdad in Arizona and um, I was spending the night before I went into a one week silent retreat that I'd booked. It was like some friend had suggested this to me. It was a spiritual retreat and I didn't ascribe to the spirituality, but I heard that I could just, you know, have like total peace and quiet to get my focus back and heal. And I was so ashamed at my stepdad's the night before I went because he had just cared for my mom and his own mother, one after the other, while they died of lung cancer. It was like my mom, then my grandmother. And then, if you can believe it, while he was caring for both of them, he suddenly realized that he had some very advanced cancer, serious cancer. He wasn't a smoker, and he he, he survived. He's, he's well to this day, but this visit was in the very early days of his survival. So he was in a pretty, you know, intense place. Now, he is not the type to lecture, but I had a pretty good idea how he would feel about my smoking and I didn't have the heart to do that to him. So I was sitting in the back steps of the house that last night. I decided to have one last cigarette and make another plan for however many times I'd ever done that to quit the next day and then go into that retreat. And in the morning I went there and, and suddenly I had very little to do. It was like this huge, like nothing to do-ness around me. So even though it wasn't really um, what I was into, I just decided, well, I guess I'll just participate in the prayers that take place here. And there were, um, there's very little, it was a silent retreat. There was talking at dinner. And at a certain point I went and talked to somebody who worked there who was cleaning the kitchen, like doing a deep cleaning. And I was, I had like a lot of like troubles back then. I think he was maybe in his seventies or something. And he very kindly, he's like, oh, what brings you here? And I stayed up really late with him and helped him clean this kitchen and talk to him, told him all the stuff I was going through. And I barely knew who he was, but he was so kind. And he said, here, can you help me? And I helped him. I put on gloves. I helped clean the oven. And Later, he said, you know, we don't have anybody to fill this. We, we try to go into the chapel and pray 24 hours once a week. And there's this one hour that's not filled. And I wonder, you know, could you do it? And I was like, well, no, because I'm not like that. And I don't know how. And he said, oh, okay. And I said, well, you know, well, I mean, how do you do it? What do you say? So he taught me like a little prayer I could say. And I memorized it. And so I went in and I sat in the chapel for an hour. And I did the prayer, he said. And it was weird because... It was sort of unlike me and it was probably it was like one in the morning, but I stayed wide awake the whole time and I stayed a hundred percent focused on the prayer that I was saying. And it was just like a repetitive prayer. And, um, I did that and I felt like, okay, so I, he, he listened to my troubles. I did him a favor. I went and did that. All right. But that was hard for me because religious people in my view at that time were, were always just kind of mean, dumb weirdos. I mean, that's, that's kind of how I was raised. And I'm sorry to say that I had a very judgmental and narrow-minded attitude about it. One day I'll tell you about my childhood spirituality. I did make, take a deep dive into spirituality when I was like 11. I got totally ridiculed for it by my family. I pulled out and I found it was just more socially acceptable to be anti-religion. Mm -hmm. One thing I've learned about religious people is that the really wonderful ones are usually pretty low key about it and they don't push it. And so you might not even know that they're religious. So sometimes if you're sitting around, if you were like, like I was and just going, oh, they're all just such awful people. You know, you might be saying that to people who are religious, but they just kind of, you know, they just keep a low profile with it. And so something to keep in mind, <laughs> not everybody is really loud about it or, you know, out on picket lines or screaming or anything. It's um, a lot of the people who are just doing like good things in your midst and maybe helping you out. They might be religious. 
So I had no idea that at that time a lot of people in my life were religious and they just, you know, they just didn't correct me when I said stuff that was kind of negative about religious people because they were so cool. <laughs> but this retreat, the thing that I think got to me is it was just incredibly peaceful. And I thought there would, I, I thought I was there to work on a book. I was writing a book at the time and I just wanted that quiet. I was like sad, I had a book to write. And I went there for a week and I did. I, I spent a lot of time writing. But I found myself like really attracted to what the other people there were doing. It felt, there's just like this feeling that it just felt real. It felt really clean. And there was no judgment at all. It's just this really like safe place. And nobody ever like pushed me at all. They, but they would let me know sometimes in this like gentle way, you know, you're welcome to join us. Come on in. We're in, we're in this chapel like several times a day, praying, meditating. And I was like, ah, meditating. So I did the daily practice back then. I'm like, I meditate. I'll come meditate with you. And so I would just go in there and do my own form of meditation while they did theirs. And they were fine with that. They, you know, nobody stopped me. So on my own, I just found myself sinking into the silence there, doing whatever seemed good and just doing what presented itself to me. I was just kind of naturally observing the silence and naturally falling into the rhythm of the place. Being quiet for this long turned out to be really emotionally intense. So much grief was coming up and so much loneliness, my gosh, not just from being there, but from my whole life. And I was just feeling like beaten up. I had been feeling beaten up for years by my own loneliness. And more than once while I was in that retreat and those feelings were starting to come up, I would just like throw myself down on my bed. And you know, I had my own little room and it was this tidy little room. It had a bed, it had a desk and it had a bathroom. That's it. And I just would like lay face down on the bed and cry really hard and that helped me too. So most days I would go out and this is Arizona so I would hike in the desert and I would just go out by myself for about an hour maybe at sunrise or sunset when the air was cool and then I would follow it by sitting down and writing my fears and resentments and that's part of the daily practice technique that I teach all of you in just like every video. I still do it every day. And at that time, I, um, you know, I still had the struggle of smoking, but I was doing the daily practice for about three years then, but not consistently. When I did do it, it was incredibly comforting. And it was a little bit re-regulating, even though like dysregulation was not something I or anybody knew was like the phenomenon that happens with childhood PTSD. I didn't even know I had childhood PTSD. I thought I was just like this unique kind of damaged person. And now I know it's like my pattern is like so many people's pattern who had abuse and neglect when they were a kid. So I'd also been meditating for a few years at that point, but not twice a day like I was supposed to. But there, while I was at that retreat, I was finally able to meditate the twice a day routine. And it was powerful. So in that environment where people were going in and praying all the time, I kind of went in and began to experiment a little bit. I did what you might call desperate prayer, prayers of desperation. And I would do it in the morning and evening, usually crumpled up on the floor or on the bed, you know, this, this position again. And I go, please stop me from smoking. If you're real, would you please stop me from smoking? And then before bed, I would just say, thank you for giving me this one day without smoking. Because even one day was pretty hard for me to get back then. I got through the first day. I got through a few days. I got through that whole week. And this delicious feeling of healing was starting to take root inside me. And I left that retreat. And then I went and stayed at my stepdad's house for another week. My brother was in college back then. And he was um, like a sports, sports trainer at a big pool and so he helped me to start strengthening my muscles again because keep in mind I just had Graves disease treatment and radiation and my muscles you know my fingernails were coming off I lost hair I was I was really weak back then and he helped me just start like paddling in the water he gave me a little flotation belt even just so I would be safe I was that weak so then, and then he'd, he'd uh, have a snack lined up for me. <laughs> I'm much older than him, but he took care of me like I was a little kid. It was like this really precious time together. So he'd, you know, he'd give me these instructions to swim and float and then snack and rest. And it was so nice. I was very comforted and felt really supported. And I think that was a little piece of how I got off cigarettes too. And after that, I spent three days driving back to my home in Northern California 
and you can do it in like 16 hours, but I took my time and I took the beautiful roads. And in particular, I took my favorite highway in the whole world, Highway 395 in the Eastern Sierra, which I just think is the most beautiful place on earth. And I go every year to hike and camp and hang out, and I always feel good there. And this was late spring this, this particular year, and there was this mix of a warm sun shining in spots on the valley and then lightning and streaks of gray rain just like washing across this valley. It's called the Owens Valley, if you've ever been there. There are huge mountains on either side. And I was driving by myself, which for me is actually like a kind of a very uh, intense way to, to be with myself. And I knew, I knew something had changed in me. And when I was back in my life, back in my apartment, back with the people I normally hung out with, I kept on writing and meditating twice a day, religiously, if you will. And it made it possible to get through the intense emotions that I was going through and to not smoke. And I stopped drinking alcohol at that time. It, it had not ever been hard for me to not drink, but I stopped because, because it was a trigger for smoking. In the past, um, you know, successful days not smoking could be completely lost if I just had a beer or something. And I think that's common for people. So more days went by and then months went by and I kept praying. And I still, I still felt kind of like ashamed about it. I didn't tell people about it really, but I was able to move from like, please help me not smoke to some other hopes and needs. Like, please let me have a real home. Please let me have a family. I wanted a family so much. And I continued writing, meditating. And within a couple of years, I met someone. And if you've heard my story, this did not end up being my lifelong partner, but we did get married and have two kids together. And I'm very grateful to say that when I was pregnant and nursing those kids, I was smoke free. And when I'd been off cigarettes for eight years, I tried like very carefully with companions to see what would happen if I drank alcohol, if I could do it without smoking. And I could, it was fine, eight years. <laughs> so here's the weird thing. Since that summer when I quit, I have not had so much as one slip or even a craving for cigarettes. And that is the part that I say is impossible. Like the way that I needed to smoke, it was like the way that I need to breathe. It was so strong. And to have it just like be gone one day, right, was amazing. Now, full disclosure, when I quit, I was using nicotine patches, if you care about that kind of thing. I found them really helpful. But I'd used patches and gum and hypnosis and classes and all that stuff, 12-step groups, many, many times before that. And I could never bear the overwhelming cravings. And I just had to smoke again. Like the cravings never stopped. I could get myself, you know, some time off, but it was just what they call in like AA, like white knuckling, you know, just hanging on. So even when the doctor told me to stop, I couldn't stop. Even when I came to sense that death was like clinging to my lungs, I couldn't stop. Even when my mom died, of smoking, I, I, I had not smoked at that time for five days or something and I flew, de flew home and I went and sat on the bed where she had died and I looked around and her cigarettes were sitting on the side of the bed. And I picked one up and I lit it and I smoked it. You know, I just didn't even have the power to not do that. That felt bad. So that's why I'm just saying it's a miracle. My compulsion to smoke was so huge and one day it was gone and I did a lot of footwork leading up to that moment, but when it finally happened, it was like, poof. I've had a few miracles in my life, but there is always some kind of scientific explanation, maybe on some of them, except in this case, there is no scientific explanation for the fact that one day that desire to smoke was completely gone and never came back. And if this is possible, I think, anything is possible, and this knowledge that anything is possible completely changed my direction in my, of my life. So this begs the question, right? With childhood PTSD, is spirituality necessary? Or are practical techniques enough? And I can't answer that for you. The techniques and ideas I'm showing you are from my own approach, adopted from the pieces I've learned from reading and living and learning from now several mentors, including people who are spiritual, and in some cases religious and also atheists. And though what I teach you 
is not specific to any faith and it works on a practical level all by itself, I can't say that I'd even be in a position to teach if I hadn't had a spiritual experience. I want to say whether or not you believe in miracles or God or a power outside of yourself that can help you, the power of the methods I teach, the writing, the meditating, the clearing up of your life problems, that power is very accessible and requires no belief and, and it's steady and you can count on it and there's no freaky weirdos who come in and demand that you conform to anything. And that's why I like it. That's why I've been able to stick with it. If it's really just practical techniques that do the trick, it doesn't matter whether you ascribe spiritual significance to it. And if it is powered by God, it may not matter that you know that. So just like it may not matter if you know the atomic composition of a water molecule, you can just take a drink of nice cool water, right? But if you're doing all the footwork you know how to do to heal, and yet there's still this one small part of you that believes or hopes that there is a power out there that can meet you right where you are in that point where your own capacity to heal your life is getting stuck. It doesn't hurt to ask. It doesn't hurt to, to try. So that's what I think you might as well try. So if you need a simple, plain way to pray that fits what you believe, you can use my daily practice for this. It works as a prayer for people who are secular as well as, um, as for people who are religious. You can customize it. You can customize the thing at the end where you release or ask for removal of those fears. So here's a video where you can learn a little bit more about that right here, and I will see you very soon. <laughs>